Hello everyone, welcome to the Geoecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos on geography, environment and research methodology on this channel. So in this session, we are going to learn about a very interesting concept related to perspectives in human geography that is about language, religions and secularization. So we'll be talking about the spatial pattern of various languages across the world and India. We'll be also looking into the advent of religion across the world, their spatial patterns. And also at the end, we'll be talking about the process of secularization. So don't go anywhere. Keep watching till the end. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and share the videos with others as well. So now, first let's talk about language. Now when we say language, how is it associated to geography? How is it part of perspectives in human geography? Let's understand. So language is basically what? It's a system of conventional spoken, manual or written symbols at first that we say is alphabet from where we derive various meanings. So by which what we do? Means of which human beings as a members of social group and participants in its culture do what? They tend to express themselves. So language is a tool for expression in a simple way that we say, right? So what are the various functions of languages? If you observe here, it's listed here that communication, right? Then expression of identity, play, imaginative expression and emotional release. These are the five important functions of a language. Now, when we understood this language as a concept, its functions, its attributes, what is important here? That how is it associated to geography, geographical concepts? So if you observe carefully, you'll find there is a spatial pattern of languages in the world. It means language changes from location to location. And when we say there is a locational aspect, a spatial aspect in the language, it becomes purely human geography concept. Right. So understand in this particular flow diagram, there is also something called dialect. And what is this dialect? One is called geographical dialect and one is called social dialect. So dialect is basically a particular form of language that is limited to a particular location or a social region. Right. And when we say social region, it means a region dominated by a particular group or social group. Right. That's where a dialect forms. And also what we know is that more than 1700 dialects exist in India. Right. So we can say that there are several dialects that is basically talking about a division in the space. Right. In terms of linguistic plurality, language is a plural concept. Right. So there is a plurality in the language across the space. And that's why we say that language is also related to perspectives in human geography. So now let's elaborate and understand this linguistic typology classification. How have these languages been classified in a spatial connotation? So what we observe here to be able to discuss certain linguistic types, it's very important to understand the list of these large language groups. So they are specified according to three criteria. And what are the three criteria? One is called genealogical familiarity, then structural familiarity and then geographic distribution. Three things are very important. One is on the basis of genealogy, the genesis, the origin. The other is on the basis of structure, the composition and structure of a language, how it is built, what is its grammatical structure, right? And the third is geographic distribution of that language. And that is where we are concerned, right? So according to these criteria, the below are important language family groups across the world. Right. So what you observe? Indo-European language, Sino-Tibetan language, Nigger-Congo language, Afro-Asiatic language, Austronesian language, Altaic language, Japonic language, Austro-Asiatic language and then Thai Kadai. So we have almost nine major linguistic groups across the globe if you observe as a spatial pattern. So what you need? We need a world map to locate them. So if you locate in this world map, there is a very interesting colorful spatial pattern emerging out of languages. And that's why we say that geography is about the combination of these several attributes. When we say physical part, then it is physical geography. When we say human attributes, for example, language we are studying right now, that's a human attribute, also makes a spatial pattern in human geography. And that is how it's visible on the map. So if you observe this map, you have human language families across the continents, right? And you observe Indo-European, 
in which you have Germanic, Indo-Iranian, Romance, Salvic, then you have Sino-Tibetan in which you have Chinese, then you have Nigger Congo, this blue color in covering the entire Africa and apart from that we have Afro-Asiatic as well as Arabic language as well under Afro-Asiatic if you see, then Austronesian, then you have Dravidian, Turkish, Mongolian, Thai Kadai and others for example Japanese and Korean. Right. So you observe these various types of languages groups across the world which creates an interesting colorful pattern. If we really want to draw a map of different languages, it's looking so colorful. It means the world is diverse in terms of language, in terms of spatial pattern. And that's why it's also important to understand the spatial pattern through the data. So what the data we have? These are the languages. This is their family and this is the rough amount of speakers in the world in terms of millions and these are the areas where we see is location or where we see is geography right so for example Chinese is a Sino-Tibetan language which we say Mandarin and then 1197 million people are the speakers of this and China Taiwan and Singapore is where Chinese is mainly spoken right then Spanish Indo-European 406 and Spain, Latin America, Southwestern United States, English 335, British Isles, US, Canada, Caribbean, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Philippines, former British colonies like Asia, Africa and India. We, we also use English as one of the official languages apart from Hindi, right? So what you observe? These are spatial patterns of languages across the continents, right? And that's why we say it's purely a human geography concept. And now coming to Indian context, in our constitution in the 8th schedule, what we observe, 22 languages are the premier languages or the prime languages in India, which is mentioned, which have been referred to as the scheduled languages, giving recognition, status and official encouragement. Right. But it's not just 22 languages. Remember, there are more than 1700 dialects as well. Right. And apart from this, our constitution also gives special distinct class that is classical language, we say, as to Kannada, Malayalam, Odia, Sanskrit, Tamil and Telugu. These are classified as classical languages in India. Right. So government of India has awarded this distinction to actually understand their rich heritage. So this is part of rich cultural heritage in India and independent culture they have. These languages also relate to the independent cultural attributes as well. Right. So if you observe these facts here, India contains a variety of languages, almost 78.05% of Indians speaking those that belong to Indo-Aryan family language. Then Dravidian languages are spoken by about 19.64, close to 20% of people. And then remaining is 2.31%, which is belonging to a variety of language families. For example, Thai Kadai and Austro-Asiatic groups. Right. So this is the linguistic diversity or we say linguistic plurality in India in terms of data you can observe. Right. So if you look here, linguistic typology in India, as we looked into the world pattern, this is what we observe. The Austric family, which is also called Nishad family, belongs to Austro-Asiatic subfamily and it came to India with Austric or Australoid people. If you have read about the race, Australoid race people. So it is subdivided further into groups called Munda language into Kharwar, Santhali, Munda and they have spoken where in which parts of India? In West Bengal, Jharkhand, Odisha, Chhattisgarh that is where it is spoken. Then Monkhmer is represented by Khasi Jaintia languages where they are present in Meghalaya and Nagaland and Santhali and Nicobari we can find where in Jharkhand and Andaman. So they are all Austric family languages that is one type. Then you observe Dravidian family, the Dravida that we say. So Dravidian of Mediterranean racial stock got pushed to East, Central and South Indian by Indo-Aryans. That is a proper popular theory which has also been criticized by many that this was a Max Muller theory. But now this theory is also under criticism. But for now what we study is still this theory holds true in many parts and is applied to the knowledge forms where we are studying. So we say that this is the 
truth as validated by most of these scholars in that way right so the main language of dravidian family are telugu then we have tamil then kannada malayalam gondi kuruk rao and several others so these are all dravidian family dravid family languages then if you observe the other languages in india the sino tibetan family or we say kirata languages so out of the four linguistic families in india the sino tibetan group family is most heterogeneous group why it is heterogeneous it comprises of 70 languages inside this one sino-tibetan family that's why it's called a heterogeneous group combination of several small 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 languages inside a huge family that is spoken basically in tibeto himalayan regions and northeastern states in india right so important languages in sino-tibetan family if you observe the list here tibetan bhotia kinnori lepsha right that is spoken in himachal in ladakh and sikkim then we have miri adi mishi akka dafla and abor of assam and arunachal pradesh then we have bodo garo khaba mikhir tripuri then we have angami sarna manipuri lushai koinak of assamese burmese family that is in northeastern states in india right and then fourth family the major family that we observe as a special pattern of languages in india is indo-european family which we observe as 78 percent of india speaks this family languages right so it's bifurcated into two branch one is called dardic aryans now remember dardic aryans or dardic aryans are those people who are mountain community right so they belong to kashmir especially in kashmir areas and upper himachal areas where you have kashmiri as a major language but remember they are profoundly influenced by sanskrit and prakrit right that's important to understand and also many scholars are of the opinion that kashmiri is also an indo-aryan rather than dardic but there is a distinct classification as for us to understand now so indo-aryan language consists of what hindi bengali punjabi and remember bengali is not language many people also say that bengali are people they are cultures but language is bangla okay so that's important here to correct and also gujarati sindhi then we have kachi then we have marathi odia sanskrit assamese and urdu which are included in indo-aryan languages right so if you observe the list what we say that's a huge diversity of language or we can say linguistic plurality in india and the emergence of indian states after independence this linguistic plurality played a major role because majorly we have a division of states on the basis of these major languages right so we observe another example that how languages are geographical travel across india from north to south east to west you'll find how languages changes with space that itself is a huge example we can give for this particular thing that how language or linguistic plurality is part of human geography or perspectives in human geography. So if you observe this map of India, this is a language map of India and what you observe from top to bottom from east to west what we observe there is a huge diversity right. So this is the list you can pause the video here and look into this map and you can practice this map for your exam as well that where which language is spoken which comes from which major family in india right so that's about majorly world languages group world family groups and the indian family groups of languages now the next thing that we need to learn here is about religion how religion emerged and how it is having also a spatial pattern a geographical pattern across the globe in india so first of all before going into the spatial pattern let's understand the basic points where religion is concerned so religion is basically what it's a socio-cultural system of designated behaviors practices morale belief worldviews text sanctified places prophecies ethics or organizations all these things comprise a religion right so religion is a huge umbrella under which you have several connotations which you observe here right so it relates to basically several transcendental spiritual elements sometimes supernatural elements as well right but however remember one point there is no single definition of a religion right it's a multicultural aspect so it has a multitude of definition you'll find different cultures have defined religion in different ways right so there is no scholarly consensus first of all this is very important to understand that everyone defines religion in their own particular way over what precisely constitutes a religion 
right so religion is a combination or what we can say is a collection of all these factors now if we go into a definitional aspect or a meaning aspect that where this first meaning comes from this word religion so the word meaning is derived from latin word religare and what is this religare it's basically to bind to make people bind into one right to make them a group Right, that's what the basic meaning of religare is. So there is a bond between man and gods that is discussed in religious lines, which binds people into one. Other meanings are also there. For example, obligation, bond or reverence. These are basic English meaning derived from Latin. Right. So what we observe, the study of religion basically comprises of what? It comprises of wide variety of academic disciplines. And if you have heard of these disciplines, theology, comparative religion, social scientific studies, right? So these are major aspects of academics under which various religions, their origin, their evolution, their various factors, their connotations, their belief systems, their cultures are being studied under what practices it occupy the spaces, right? So that is being studied in these branches and theories of religion offer various explanations for the origins and working of the religion as well. Right. So when we go into the academics of religion, we understand how these explanations have shaped up. And that's a purely human attribute, if you observe, right, a human creation. So it includes the ontological foundations of religious beliefs and being existence. Right. So when we say ontological belief, it means what is that exists this particular question. Right. This is answered under this particular segment of religious studies like theology, comparative religion, social scientific studies. Right. Now, let's understand one more thing here that the concept of religion is not very old. Why? Many people think that religion concept is very old. No, remember this religion concept was formed just in 16th, 17th century when colonialism was dominating the world. So what was before that? There is important thing here to understand that despite the fact that ancient sacred texts like Ramayana, Mahabharata, Quran, Upanishad, Bible, Quran and others are there in which so many things have been given but never this word religion you will find in them. Right. It means this concept of religion is not there in the originality. This is a construction of colonialism which dominated the world and this word religion was now across the cultures, right? That's how people started to say this word religion. Earlier, the word religion itself did not exist, isn't it? So many times in India, if you observe, religion is taken as an official word for census, right? But understand that many times people get confused between two words called religion and dharma. Now, there is one interesting take here that Sanskrit word dharma sometimes translated and misunderstood as religion. Right. These are two different things, but we take it interchangeably. We use it wherever we want. But the idea is that a dharma was never talked about and never interpreted in the texts or in the oral traditions as religion. Right. In Indian context, if we say. Right. Because the religion concept itself is Western concept that came to India through colonialism. Right. So in Sanatan cultures that we say that is through practices. Right. So dharma is one of the four components of Purushartha, which has been explained in various texts, in various Puranas and Upanishads. Right. So the aim of life signifies behaviors and are considered to be in accord with the Rita. So what is this Rita? This Rita is the order thing that we say and it includes duties, rights, laws, conduct, virtues and right way of living. So in India, Dharma was understood in these words. If you want to explain Dharma in certain words, in certain vocabularies, how can you explain? You cannot explain Dharma in terms of religion, right? You can use it interchangeably. It is being done interchangeably. Even by census of India, you, it gives you a category across population in terms of religion, right? But in India, if you observe the old text, the word religion does not exist. Dharma exists and Dharma has been described in these meanings. So, this word Rita, right, of which Dharma is one part, remember this Rita is basically order, rule or truth, which is basically a principle of natural order. So, basically Dharma is talking about orderness. It's talking about a rule, about a conduct, about a virtue rather than just binding people together, right? It's talking about multiplicity in Indian context. 
right that is the clear cut difference between a dharma and religion which is important to understand at least for textual connotation because there are various interpretations of religion and also there are various interpretations of dharma across cultures right but to understand basic word meanings and how it came to us and how we study this in geography as a spatial pattern across world and india it's important to understand now if you observe the word religion across india in terms of census of india as i was saying so what does census of india say india has a distinction of being a land from where various important religions namely hinduism buddhism sikhism jainism have originated so what we observe regional coexistence of this diverse religious groups in the country makes our country really unique we say unity and diversity right and it's the epithet that we use always that is unity in diversity right and if you observe the last 2011 census it gives us what religion in one column percentage here and estimated population so you observe hindu muslim christian sikh buddhist jain and others right this is the several category of religions if you observe indian context and their percentages are given right so what we observe the census of india officially defines these particular religions that exist in india and that's important to learn here but it's important not to confuse between the word dharma and religion right that's what you should understand as a textual analysis now why we study religion and what is its need in geography here why are we talking about religion here why did we talk about language because remember this is not just about one culture it's also about space and its attribute created by human beings part of human space that's what we understand here as human geography attribute right so religious festivals food ceremony are shaped by physical environment it helps study the religion and environmental relationships and religion supports sustainable development environment conservation and improve the welfare of population as a basic premise isn't it that's why we understand that religion is not just part of a particular faith or a particular people to believe or practice but it's also in relation to human beings milieu that they construct isn't it so that's why we need to understand so when we understand this there is another thing here diffusion of religion across the world and across india so if you see diffusion of religion it means from a center where the religious thing emerged or originated how it actually diffused across the space so what are the processes behind it now if we learn geographical history here of religion there are several factors that we need to understand which is behind this diffusion of religion across the world so invasion conquering missionary politically imperialism expansion of political boundaries and migration of population these are several factors across the religions of the world if you find that's why these religions expanded from the source of origin on the basis of these factors isn't it so what you observe again in religion like language we have a colorful spatial pattern of the globe right so what you observe look here this one is christianity islam hinduism buddhism judaism chinese religions korean religions shinto folk religions and there are certain places where still we don't have any religion as such right so this is this colorful picture that tells us that religion also is spatial in nature it is regional in nature isn't it that's why it's geographical in nature right so now the last point in this lecture is secularization and what does it mean so when we say religion spread across the world now it's important to understand what is this process of secularization so this is a process in which religion loses its social and cultural significance so what happens here here the societies or we say modern societies makes restrictive policies about practicing religion right it means basically what it means that one cannot impose their faith of religion on the other so when we say there is everyone that is important not just one religion is more important that is a secular behavior isn't it so what we observe here in secularized societies what happens faith lacks cultural authority 
one thing then religious organizations have very little social power and also public life proceeds without reference to supernatural or religious connotations of various kinds so secularization is basically about modernity the long-term societal change and has a consequences for religion itself by the end of 19th century it became one of the reference of shifting places of religion in the society by scholars and they said to be modern we have to be secular this was the definition right so the very notion of secularization has provoked contention for more than a century and there is a huge debate across india across world on what should be the path of modernity shall it be religious path faith part or shall it be secular path which is more important right which is more sustainable so remember there is a scholar called max weber he also talked about this process of secularization and his work is very interesting in terms of the course of secularization through history which has also been criticized by many other scholars so secularization process includes these points that you can remember in short right so making people more logical and rational that is about being scientific being evident not talking about supernatural or metaphysical right improve the scientific understanding then remove the dominance of religious institutions and symbols from society that is one aspect of being secular then separate religion from state a very important aspect is that state is for everyone religion is for the believers and practitioners of that faith right and then cultural shifts in society and make the society free from superstition right and communal harmony right because many times because of religious tensions communal disharmony or communal tensions come up communal riots have happened across india and world right so these are the major things associated with secularization so now when we have learned about various aspects of languages religion and secularization in terms of human geography in the sessions to come we'll be talking more on other aspects of perspectives in human geography so stay tuned stay safe keep watching keep learning and don't forget to share the videos with others as well